Please open your Bibles to Acts 11, 19 through 30, as we read together in Scripture. This is to the church in Antioch. Now, those, had been, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged all, of, all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number, number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did this they did in sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Thank you, Michelle. I'm going to put Pat's stuff back because he's my brother in the Lord. Uh, this will be close, Pat. It's not exact. It's my effort. All righty. Well, it's been so great this morning. So many good things that we're able to pray through and think through and even some of the tough things just to be in unity together. Uh, back in my college days, I had a phase in my life uh, of skateboarding. And uh, I'll actually show you a picture here. This is a picture of me back in my skateboarding days. This is what I looked like in college. If you believe that, thank you. I appreciate that. That's not me. The next picture is actually me. <laughs> you are so impressed. On the left in that black jean jacket, uh, that's Jerry Johnson circa a different year. Now, I realize that most of you are actually probably looking at the clown. Pay no attention to the clown, please. The clown may or may not be a young woman I asked to marry me. It's an entirely different story, entirely different illustration. This is the only picture I could find with me holding one of my skateboards. So anyhow, back to skateboarding. In college, uh, my friend Barry and I, that's my roommate Barry on the right, once in a while we would go down to Rosedale Mall. We'd skate there from Northwestern College. I think it's called the Rosedale Center now or something like that. But it was a great spot for skateboarders. Lots of blacktop, lots of different interesting things to skate around, uh, and we'd have a good time, uh, and it was always better than homework. So we'd go down there, skate around, and sometimes we would run into other skateboarders. And as you run into other skateboarders, you know, you start kind of showing each other, you know, what trick you can do and what trick I can do. Uh, and occasionally you would have some other skateboarders who would challenge you to a game of poser. Poser is kind of like a horse, if you've ever played it in basketball, where you shoot and you spell out horse and you, you, you try to make all your shots. Except instead of shooting baskets, you would try to land a skateboard trick. And if you could pull off a trick and then the other person couldn't match it, they would get a P, then an O, S, E, R, and ultimately the point was to try to demolish your opponent and point at them and say, you're not a skateboarder, you're just a poser. So anyhow, it was, it was a fun game, um, except I pretty much was a poser. Uh, I really wasn't that much of a skateboarder. I really enjoyed skateboarding. I did know a few tricks. Um, and I got to class much faster because Northwestern, if you've been there, you can go downhill, you can get to class pretty quick. Um, but I also just like traveling on my skateboard. So when we would go to the mall like a mile away, it just didn't take that long on a skateboard. Um, but I really couldn't do some of the like real tricks, like some of the legit, authentic skater moves. 
like an ollie, for example. I'm sure you all know what an ollie is, but ollie is when you jump with your board coming with you and like go over the top of a skate uh, over a picnic table or something like that. But I couldn't do that or a lot of things <laughs> that an authentic skateboarder could do. And here's the point of this illustration. There are a fair number of people in our world today who call themselves Christians, but they're posers. They are not authentically following Jesus. They might take the title Christian, they might use it kind of loosely, but they are not really following Christ. They're posers. They might wear some Christian jewelry. They might even quote a few Bible verses out of context from time to time. Perhaps they even go to church once in a while. But if we were to dig deep, if we were to really challenge one another, there would be times where people would have to just admit that they're a poser Christian, that their faith would not hold up to scrutiny. Now let me reassure you, our point here this morning is not to look around and decide who's an authentic Christian and who's not an authentic Christian or to judge one another. That is not at all the point of the sermon. But because of the text we're looking at today, we are going to consider how we can define authentic Christianity. We're going to look at Acts 11, and we're going to see what the Antioch church has to teach us about what it means to be an authentic Christian. And before we dive into the text, let's pray and ask God to help us in all this. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we've had to pray for the Sternemans and pray for Little Lane and pray for Camp Oak Hills, uh, to worship you through our giving and even fellowshipping with one another uh, before the service and the songs we can sing and just all of these different components that help us in our faith. And now, Lord, as we come to your word, we pray that by your spirit, you would please enlighten this text Help us to see clearly what it means and what it has to teach us about an authentic Christian faith. May we learn it and then may we apply it. May we live it out in a way that would bring you glory. Please help us now, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope your Bible's already open to Acts 11, verse 19. If not, please turn there now or click there now. What we're going to see happening in Acts 11 is it actually flashes back to Acts chapter 8. We were there a couple of months ago, but the Luke, the author of Acts, is actually going to bring us back to some of what was happening then. In Acts 11:19, it begins, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. There's a lot of different locations listed here, so let's look at our map together. Uh, today's passage has a couple places. Jerusalem is kind of a pivotal point, helps us get our bearings a little bit there. If you look at that orange arrow on the, the bottom center, the south end of our map, you'll see Jerusalem there. And that's where all of this stuff pretty much started. Um, then we have Phoenicia, which is a region somewhat ways north of Jerusalem. It's the Blue Arrow. You see that it stretches kind of along the coast there, the northeast coast of the Mediterranean Sea. If you're a geography buff, you might know that that's modern-day Lebanon. And then Cyprus is an island, a beautiful Mediterranean island. It's on the west side there, you see another Blue Arrow pointing up to Cyprus. Uh, and this is actually the hometown of Barnabas, who's a key person in today's story. Then we have Antioch, and this is actually the main city, the primary city that we're going to learn about in the church that was there. It's on the northeast corner of our map. It's about 15 miles inland from the Mediterranean, and it's on the north end of Syria. You'll see there a blue arrow. And at this time in history, we might be surprised to learn this, um, but actually Antioch is a very prominent city. Antioch is incredibly important at this time in history. It was the third largest city 
in the entire Roman Empire. It had as many as half a million people. So this wasn't a little town. This wasn't a small village. This was a huge metropolis. It was multi-ethnic and had a huge population. Now, Cyrene is also mentioned in the text, but it's not on this map. Cyrene is way over in North Africa. It's not even on the map that we have up here. But some of you, especially the week after Easter here, when you hear Cyrene, it might trigger something in your synapses, and you're like, why does Cyrene sound just a little familiar? And you may remember that Simon from Cyrene helped Jesus carry his cross part of the way to Calvary. And what's interesting to note about that, besides just that very fact, is that in Acts 11.20, we learn that Simon from Cyrene was not the only one who helped Jesus carry the cross. Now, I don't mean this literally, but there were other men from Cyrene who carried the message about the cross to Antioch. And the difference between these men who carried the message of the cross and Simon who carried the actual cross is that Simon was forced to do it. But these men chose to do it. They were so convinced by what they believed that they shared the message and they carried it to Antioch. And so I think that's pretty cool. Tarsus, we don't want to leave out Tarsus, way up on the top there, the north there, that that green arrow, that is the birthplace of, of Saul, and it actually happens to be where Saul is at this time in history, and we're going to see this as we go through the text, but Barnabas has to travel from Antioch, and that's what that circle is there, and get Saul from Tarsus. So Acts 11, it flashes us back to Acts 8, but really the flashback is much further than just Acts 8. It actually flashes us back to Acts 1-8, and Jesus' words, the key verse, the prediction that Jesus made that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses down in Jerusalem but also in Judea and Samaria to the north and to the ends of the earth, well beyond the the lands of the Jews. The gospel is spreading. God's design The scattered church, scattered by this persecution, is continuing to make its intended impact. The gospel is going forth. Well, one of the first things that the church in Antioch teaches us about authentic Christianity is that authentic Christians believe and share the good news about Jesus. Acts 11.21 tells us the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, these people who were declaring the message, who were sharing Jesus, hadn't really been Christians all that long themselves. Fairly recently, they had put their own faith in Jesus and had become believers, but now they were sharing this good news. They were telling others about Jesus. And verse 21 says, the Lord's hand was with them. But who's them? What is this them? Who are these in verse 21 that the Lord was with? John Stott calls them unnamed evangelists. And Acts 8.4 reminds us that those who had been scattered, these them, preached the word wherever they went. So that's who these them are. And I'm sorry, English teachers, if I didn't say that correctly. But just so we're clear, these unnamed evangelists, we're not talking here about the apostles. We're not talking about pastors. We're not talking about well-known, big-name evangelists. We're talking about good old, gospel-believing, lovers of Jesus who are living out their faith. Because authentic Christians believe, and they're transformed by that belief, and they're forever changed by that belief, and they not only believe, but then they share the good news wherever they go. Not just the apostles, but every believer. The the key to sharing the good news with others isn't about being an apostle or being a well-known evangelist or about being a pastor or an elder. The key to all of this is that the Lord's hand is at work, that God's in the midst of it, working through his people. 
And any belief, any lasting change that happens in another person's life is only because the Lord is at work. Because he is doing his work in us and through us for his glory. So it's not about our hands. It's about the hand of the Lord. Now we certainly have a role to play in being faithful and sharing that message with others. But nothing miraculous, nothing life-changing is going to happen apart from the work of the Lord. The Jerusalem church's choice to send Barnabas in verse 22 was a great choice. And there were a couple reasons for this, but one of the main reasons is that if you're looking for someone to encourage you, Barnabas is your guy. He was one of the very best at encouraging others. In fact, his real name was Joseph, but nobody called him Joseph. Okay, maybe his mom called him Joseph. But nobody else called him Joseph. Everyone called him Barnabas, and many of you will remember why. Way back in Acts 4.36, we learned about this, that Joseph was a Levite from Cyprus, from that island in the west that we just talked about. That's where he was from. But the apostles called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. They renamed him because it was such a character trait of his to be an encourager. But there's another reason why Barnabas was a great choice. And it has to do with that Cyprus thing. You see, he had something in common with these evangelists who, if you'll remember, were from Cyprus and Cyrene because he himself was also from Cyprus. And so he understood kind of that part of the world. He understood what was going on on the outskirts of Jerusalem and outside of Judea and Samaria. He had lived abroad and he knew how those kind of people would think and approach life. And so he was a really good candidate to go in and encourage and work alongside of these other evangelists. Verses 23 and 24 go on. When Barnabas arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Doesn't it make you so glad when you see God's grace at work in other people's lives? Last week, if you were here for our baptism, wasn't it just such an encouraging thing? Didn't it just make you glad to think of people making that public statement, identifying with the Lord? This makes us glad. It's so great to celebrate when we see God's grace working in someone else's life. But we're not glad just because we can chalk up another decision for Christ. We're not glad just because we're like, oh, there's a big attendance. Whoa. We're not impressed by the numbers. What's amazing, what's wonderful, what's impressive to us is that God's grace is at work. And that is something to be glad about and excited about and to celebrate. Now, to be fair, verse 24, it does mention a great number A great number of people were brought to the Lord, and that is worth celebrating. Praise the Lord for anyone who comes to the Lord, anyone who comes to faith. But it mentions this to point out that there's this growing need in the Antioch church. You see, Barnabas recognized this. This wonderful opportunity, but it was kind of a wonderful problem. There were so many new believers that needed to be discipled that needed to be cared for and taught about this newfound faith of theirs. And so Barnabas realizes that he needs to set up this intentional discipleship strategy because of all the good things God is doing in this church. And authentic Christians learn and teach God's truth. We see this in verses 25 and 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year... Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. In verse 24, great numbers are brought to the Lord. In verse 26, great numbers are taught about the Lord. They're brought and then they're taught. The discipleship need is so great in Antioch that Barnabas goes and he gets Saul, says, come on over, I I need you, we need you, this church needs you. And they teach all these new believers. And there's two really interesting things to note here about this partnership. 
First of all, Barnabas is not concerned about protecting his turf, about being able to brag about how all of this was his work or who gets the credit. But he humbly invites in Saul. He says, Saul, you're fairly nearby, about 100 miles away. Can you come over to this other place, help out? And it's this team effort working together to build up these new believers as disciples of Christ. The second thing worth noting is that Saul spends a lot of his time teaching and discipling, a whole year of his time in one place. And when we think of Saul, who we also call Paul, the Apostle Paul, we tend to think of him as this traveling evangelist. He never spent much time in one place. He's always moving around. And those of you who've read further in the book of Acts, you know that we're about to get to the missionary journeys and he's traveling all over the world. And we get this idea that he never really stays anywhere very long. But that's actually not very accurate. See, Saul did a lot of teaching, a lot of discipling, a lot of training up of new believers and investing in them so that their roots would go deep and their faith would be genuine and lasting and and thrive. In other words, Saul viewed teaching believers as equally important to evangelizing the lost. They went hand in hand. Evangelism and teaching were both important to him and to the early church. And to put it more directly, every local church needs a strategy for winning and building and equipping. Win the lost, build up believers, and equip those believers for ministry to others. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we see happening here at the church in Antioch. Again, it's not so much about the numbers who were being saved or the numbers who were being discipled. It was really about this intentional strategy to progressively help people grow and develop in their faith, to grow in Christian maturity, each and every Christian going deeper, going further, a greater understanding of what authentic Christianity is all about, what it means to follow Christ. In verse 23, Barnabas encourages them to build the kind of faith that will help you remain true to the Lord with all your heart. Those are the kind of believers that Saul and Barnabas were training up and teaching. Being an authentic Christian means being a learner. In fact, the word disciple means learner. We saw this verse in our bumper video, the the Great Commission from Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It was Jesus' instruction to his followers. That's why it's so critical for each and every person gathered here in this building or watching via live stream. It's so important for every one of us who is part of Ephraim Bemidji to jump into a life group. Got my pin on today or to jump into a Bible study, to be part of our family worship night, or part of middle school youth group or high school youth group, or some other adult ministry in our church, to grow in our own faith, to develop in that faith, not just one hour on Sunday morning, but something more that helps us go deeper. Some of us will teach, but all of us will be fellow learners together. I checked in with Pastor Eric about this, and he said that we have two brand new spiritual formation groups coming up this summer. Uh, They won't be for a couple months yet, but just so you know, those are coming. One is on Christianity Explored, and the other one is on the Bible's Big Story. It's an introduction to biblical theology. And you can watch your bulletin in the next month or so. You'll see that information. It'll be on the website as well. Verse 26 tells us something else about these disciples. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. They were actually called lots of different things. As we read through Acts, you're going to see that these believers are called believers, sometimes brothers and sisters, sometimes the church. They're also referred to as the Lord's people. The Nazarene sect, did you know you're part of the Nazarene sect? 
That one didn't hang in there quite as much. And followers of the way, Christianity used to be called the way by some people. But the one that stuck, the name that seems to be with us now some 2,000 years later, is Christian. That's the one that most of us are aware of. Sadly, however, in our culture today, the name Christian has been watered down quite a bit. It doesn't quite mean what it used to. It doesn't quite have teeth to it the way it did in Antioch. It seems like almost anyone can call themselves a Christian or pretty much everybody who's not something else is kind of lumped into everybody's kind of a Christian today. And in some ways, this title Christian has become so broad and so vague that it's not very helpful in describing what a Christian really is or ought to be. It's become unclear what we are or who we are, what we actually mean by Christian because there are so many posers, so many who maybe claim the title Christian but don't really live it and and they're posing as a Christian. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that some people mock us for being Christians. That should not surprise us. But what should bother us greatly as followers of Jesus is why they're mocking us. It'd be one thing if they were mocking us because they were mocking Jesus. After all, Jesus himself, he warned us that we would be persecuted for his name's sake, that we'd take some hits because we're connected to him. But much of the mocking that Christians hear today in America is about lacking a clear witness. It's about failing to demonstrate what devotion to Christ is really all about. And that's not to say that any one of us in this room or watching via live stream or even any of our pastors are doing this perfectly. We're all human. We're in process here. We're a work in progress. And so we stumble sometimes and we work our way through some challenges. But one of the main reasons that we're being mocked as Christians in our own day and age is that too many people who call themselves Christians have discredited and devalued the precious name of Christ. This devaluing is the result of not walking the walk, of living lives that fall way short of what it ought to mean when we identify ourselves with Christ. This didn't seem to be the problem at Antioch, though. The fact is, when people in Antioch were called Christian, it actually may have been intended as an insult. But it wasn't because the Antioch Christians weren't walking the walk. It was much the opposite. There's actually good evidence that in the Antioch church, calling someone a Christian was a derogatory way of belittling them because of their devotion to Christ. In the church at Antioch, the Christians were mostly known for one particular thing. If you were a Christian, the church in Antioch, here's what you were known for, an authentic connection to Christ. After all, that's why they called them Christians. They called them Christians, Christians. That's where the name came from. They were so well known for their connection to Christ that this name came to be in history. That's the origin of it. What an incredible thing to be known for. And yet, what an incredible responsibility. to to carry that name, to represent the name Christian, but also to represent the name Christ, which is why Christian has its meaning, its true intended meaning. Acts 11 wraps up by reminding us of another sign of authenticity. Authentic Christians care for one another as brothers and sisters. Verses 29 and 30 it says the disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. 
And in verse 28, the prophet Agabus came down. He predicted that there was going to be this severe famine and the Christians in Antioch took him at his word and so they respond as a local church with this benevolent generosity. And the people in the church up north help the church down in the south in Jerusalem. And we learn that authentic Christians practice generous stewardship of their own personal money to help fellow believers, fellow Christians. This offering was not impressed on them. Nobody forced them to do it. This was their own response, their own decision to give. And now here we are, 2,000 years later at Ephri Bemidji, and this idea of a benevolence fund is still being carried forward in an authentic Christian way. And so if you or someone you know who's part of this church family has a financial need and we can help, please let one of our elders know, one of our pastors know. Their pictures are posted out there on the bulletin board or just contact our office. It would be our privilege, it would be our honor as followers of Christ to help one another in that way. This pattern of caring for one another, it goes all the way through the book of Acts, all the way through the New Testament, all the way through history, right up to modern day. And it's why none of us should feel bashful or hesitant about receiving help from our fellow Christians because this is God's design. It's part of his plan for the local church. So we should embrace it. Care for one another. It's explicitly designed by God to be part of the local church. Well, this is just a brief three-point sermon on authentic Christianity. Certainly, we haven't covered everything. This has not been comprehensive. We haven't said anything about worship or prayer or any number of other elements we might think of when we think of an authentic faith. But it's a good start. It gets us going in the right direction. Back in January, our church had our annual celebration and vision meeting. And there were two particular things we talked about there, two specific focuses for e in 2021. And one of those focuses was on continuing to improve our care for one another. And so we want to talk about that a little bit, think about that. We're trying to improve our care for one another by encouraging everyone to prayerfully consider becoming a member of this local church. Now, if you're a member somewhere else, that's great. But if you're not a member of a local church at all, and you want to be an authentic Christian, you should really consider membership. Membership does matter. As we try to think through this, it's a definitive step toward these three things I have listed there, those three bullet points. Church membership can be a greater commitment to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. That we understand who is officially part of this local church, who it is we're caring for, and in this family relationship within the local church. But we should also understand that this is a way of greater uh, greater participation in God's intended local church. The local church is God's plan. It's his intention. And membership can kind of take that next step of participating a little more fully in the life of what's happening here. But there's also built into this a greater safety from sin and accountability Because we know exactly who has committed to this church and who it is we have to love and iron sharpens iron, who we care for and who we minister to and who we can gain trust with so that we can call each other to live out the faith in a real way. And that's all tied together in church membership. So what's holding you back? What's keeping you from becoming an official church member? I urge you to pray about that. We're also improving how we care for one another by encouraging life groups. That's why I wore my pin this morning, why I've been mentioning that. Life groups are small groups that are sermon-based discussion groups. The uh, little uh, moniker or the motto that they use is learning together and loving one another. Those are two simple things we want to accomplish for anyone who's part of a life group, that we learn together and we love one another. They meet all throughout the week, different times, different places. All the information is on the website. You can go there. It's right on the front page or talk to one of the pastors or elders. We'd love to tell you more about the life groups here at E-Free. 
Third thing we can do to care for one another is this new servant team ministry. We've talked about that quite a bit lately, and so I'm just going to jump ahead, but that's a wonderful ministry as well as we care for one another. Another focus is to continue becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus together. This is about discipleship. It's about the Great Commission, to keep making disciples. We want to continue in that, keep that front and center as a focus of our church. As a church, learning and teaching God's truth needs to be kept front and center. It needs to happen from this pulpit. It needs to happen all throughout this building. And really ministry inside this building, but also outside of this building, that everything we're doing as a church is driven toward discipleship and helping people follow Jesus more fully, more joyfully, more effectively. Wherever we are, whatever we are doing as Christians, let's just make sure we represent Christ well. Let's help this watching world to get a clear picture of authentic Christianity. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word, for this opportunity to dig into Acts 11. And we pray that you would help each one of us to pursue an authentic Christian faith, a faith that changes us, that transforms us into greater Christ-likeness, a faith that shows the watching world that Christianity truly is about Christ. Lord, please guard us from wandering from you, from wavering or selling out on our faith. Keep us close to you. Keep us from falling short of what you intend for us as faithful followers. Lord, we don't want our Christian lives to be a mockery of Christ. But instead, we want them to be a proper reflection of Christ. And even though we all have a long way to go and none of us is perfect by any means, help us to continue on this journey of becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus together. And we pray this together now as Christians who are praying in the name of Christ. And all God's people said, amen.